The Disappearing L, Erasure of Lesbian Spaces and Culture by Bonnie J. Morris. Chapter 2. By the time I got to Wombstock. Challenges and approaches to festival research. Some notes from the mosh pit. Festival organizers and producers have not left behind an easily accessed or coherent paper trail for, histori for history de detectives and anthropologists. There is no one digitized source to tap into, and the use of photographs taken at festivals requires navigating a labyrinth of written permissions. These conditions, though frustrating to the investigator, help remind us that during America's recent homophobic past, extraordinary measures had to be taken to protect the privacy and safety of any women attending a lesbian event. From the very beginning, festival organizers understood that they had to shield their own audience participants from punitive backlash by employers, ex-husbands, and a voyeuristic press. Where lesbians gathered could not be advertised too openly or celebrated via regular media channels. In contrast to almost every other trend in self-promoting American folk rock scene, during the most active years of festival culture, little about it was known to outsiders. The saying, the revolution will not be televised, certainly applied here. Television did not show it. Rolling Stone did not acknowledge it, nor did Ms. A scrapbook of press clips from women's music festivals during their first 20 years, from any print resource other than independent lesbian feminist newspapers and journals, would be eerily empty. This was a secret world, described only in the underground or alternative press. In regional women's publications, such as Off Our Backs, Washington, D.C., or Sojourner, Cambridge, Massachusetts, which were distributed via subscription or at women's bookstores. Thankfully, the entire print run of Hotwire, the Journal of Women's Music and Culture, with its excellent interview coverage and photography of festivals from 1984 to 1994, is now available digitally. But many of the other women's music periodicals reviewing festivals as they occurred are not yet accessible via Google search. Moreover, today's rapidly improving climate for lesbian and gay rights doesn't mean that classic, intimate photos taken inside of festivals can now be published or shared, not without the express permission of the often topless women and kids who appear in them. And the exchange slash use of children's images has added risks in a world more cognizant of child pornography markets. Strict rules about taking or publishing photos always prevailed at most festivals, usually addressed right up front in the programs distributed to all attending. Contact lists of workers and their records slash addresses of campers who ordered tickets were carefully guarded. These would be common ethical and archival concerns for historians and any alternative of any alternative subculture. What's so difficult for those wishing to achieve archive this era is simply reconstructing the feeling of a large-scale, exuberant, clothing-optional event. The music is certainly available for research purposes. For instance, in the previous chapter, I argued that women's music movement itself, though culturally successful and personally empowering to two generations of lesbians, had been ignored or belittled by both mainstream rock historians and the emergent field of LGBT studies. Nonetheless, the recordings produced in that era remain in circulation as cultural products. They can be obtained, handled, and studied by any genuinely interested scholar or aging fan. Recorded music, the material of this grassroots political movement, is one legacy that can be physically archived, or, well aware of that possibility, many artists are now digitizing their original oeuvre. Festival performers from... Rhiannon to Judith Castleberry are safely storing important albums and song sheets in university library archives, such as the Sophia Smith Collection at Smith College. Most of us still in possession of a tape player readily available in 2016 at Goodwill Outlets, Garage Sales, or on eBay, and of a pack of batteries can play women's music tapes, transporting the sound of the music, lesbian music revolution, where we go. classrooms, conferences, even other countries. 
teaching aboard the global semester at sea voyage during the 1993, both 1993 and 2004, I relish my uncanny opportunity to blast B.B. K. Roach, K. Roach, Meg Christian, the Deadly Nightshade, Farron, and Chris Williamson tapes from the top deck of our ship as we entered the Red Sea or sailed the Mekong into Vietnam or docked in Havana, Cuba. In contrast to the lingering cassettes and vinyl, the performance sites and spaces that once staged this women's music scene have all but vanished, and it will be impossible in future to recreate them as they were once experienced by eyewitness audience participants. Very few film crews ever gain permission to shoot inside festivals, beyond the promotional videos released by some producers, and only in more recent years personal footage that festigoers have recorded without permission on their camera phones. Although festivals, sound crews have taped and filmed stage performances, some of which may be viewed in documentaries, including D. Mossbacher's Radical Harmonies and Ellen Sparrow's Greetings from Out Here, much of the significant activity at any festival took place offstage. Lively debate in workshops, the camaraderie of a kitchen work shift, spontaneous demonstrations, and never again to be repeated dinner line skits. Mud wrestling after a downpour, life stage rituals such as commitment ceremonies and cronings, late night laughter around a campfire. It was with this later material, sorry, it was with this latter material that I personally sought to collect and preserve with my own tape recorder, camera, and pen as a young adult. I recognized a gap in the documentation of festival history at the point when I entered festival culture at the very start of the 1980s, buying my first ticket to the Michigan Festival as a 19-year-old college sophomore. For the next 35 years, I recorded everything I saw or heard there. I rushed off, journal in hand, to camp out at my first women's music festival in 1981. I'd read about Michigan in a copy of Off Our Backs, passed around at my young lesbian support group. Since 1976, the rural Wombstock had been hosting thousands of women annually during its August week of concerts on private woodland. Rumor and stereotype abound. Supposedly, one would enter naked Amazon separatists, political correctness at breakfasts, sorry, one would encounter naked Amazon separatists, political correctness at breakfasts, sex in the ferns, holistic mystery food served out of barrels, mandatory recycling work shifts, Perseid meteor showers, voyeuristic raccoons, and a meeting of a new girlfriend named Lynx or Oak, as well as the best soundstage and production values in Lesbian Nation. I entered this community in its sixth year, August 1981, the last time the festival met on the old land near Hesperia. Getting there involved 18 hours of road trip on a privately chartered Greyhound bus with 60 other defiant lesbian activists. If the journal entry I wrote after my first lesbian concert radiated euphoria, a blearier vibe characterized my writing as I headed to the Midwest that week. August 13th, 1981. This Greyhound bus is beginning to stink, and everyone is a couple but me and I had to take one single seat in the back by the tiny bathroom. I couldn't sleep with all the boozing, the pot smoking, the shrieks of laughter, the off-key singing along with bad guitar. Each new bus driver, and we've had several, had begged us to stop getting high. Please, no foreign tobaccos. One word. I'll get stoned myself and drive right off the highway. <laughs> Later. We are here, and it is over an overwhelming scene. I am surrounded, as far as the eye can see, by shirtless Amazons. Indeed, thus far, the word I'd use to sum up my first impression of the festival is breasts. I confess I feel a little lost. I threw off my own shirt, had a healing massage at The Womb, attended one workshop on psychic phenomenon and another on lesbian separatist parthenogenesis, then a sex workshop, a dramatic reading of some weird play, and then the heavens opened. My outdoor sleeping nook flooded, so I took my soggy bedroll, soggy diary, and soggy self to the communal, chem-free tent. Due to the sudden storm, one million women had decided to bunk down in the same community tent. I had to sleep in a rock-filled pit area 
one third the space of my actual body length. I was pinned in by a Japanese woman on my right, two snoring lovebirds at my feet, and a dirty guitar case and dirty guitar cases from the flooded jam tent on my left. I spent hours in the fetal position, cursing. <laughs> True to the era, within one day, I caught the spirit again. Now, I'm really at home here, thrilled to be in a place without mirrors, men, or sexism. I feel Amazon-esque as I wander, naked, aware of my muscle and back skin. Yesterday, my feet felt tender on the cricket-covered ground, but today I run swiftly over the soft hills. I love the tahini and watermelon on my tin plate. My breasts are burnt, my feet are caked in mud, I am dirtier, grimier, and slobberier than I've been in the two years since high school, yet I love how I feel. Our glamour is really from within. How can I have lived all these years without the joy of going shirtless? It feels so natural. Seeing the breasts of all these women adds new qualities to their faces. This is my life choice. I have been silent because so much of what I feel has already been expressed so eloquently by others before me in this movement. But I want to capture it all, for it has captured me. This entry records the turning point in my own life. Easily meeting women whose books I had just read in my women's studies classes or whose music I had played on the turntable all year since coming out, I charted a course of describing what they and others had to say. That, in turn, became what I wanted to say. This subculture was important, and I was not the only one to feel that way. Around me were the collected movers and shakers, agitators and theorists of the lesbian body politic. So I listened and scrawled. I took notes in food lines, during water breaks on my kitchen work shift, my flashlight in my moldy sleeping bag at night. I wrote faster and faster with intense musician Farron, sorry, when intense musician Farron strummed her guitar on stage, and I slowed as Meg Christian sang soulful southern ballads. I once again became the woman in the fourth row who was always writing in her journal during concerts. Others wandered off to find an orgy or a high while I did self-assigned history homework on a stump. I saw on stage a very different kind of American revolution altogether, one that would likely never be a test question on the AP U.S. history exam. By 1986, my efforts to capture the scene expanded. Three years of graduate work in women's history now informed my methodology and my rationale. I was determined to write the first published book on festival culture. Armed with a battery-powered tape recorder, I attended as many festivals as I could afford each summer, simultaneously tape recording everything verbatim, writing in my journal about what it meant, taking photographs at critical moments, and, most importantly, getting other women in the audience to journal along with me. There was too much to describe for one person to get it all down. Moreover, diversity and inclusion and access were part of festival politics. The views of one white grad student hardly sufficed. Now it wasn't enough that I was writing in my journal at concerts. Everyone had to, as well. I had passed my PhD orals on my 25th birthday, and to honor both occasions, my aunt Pat gave me a handsome leather-bound black journal. I decided to save the special journal for my week at the Michigan Festival in 1986. When I arrived, instead of only taking notes on my own impressions, I also passed the blank book along through the concert audiences, inviting random festigoers to write about their festival experience. What did this culture mean to them? What would they remember the most? What brought them back if this was their second, fifth, or tenth time? With considerable faith, I launched this fancy journal into a giant crowd of women I did not know, merely requesting that it be returned to my blanket at the end of the show three hours later. It circled through thousands and thousands of women, some of whom shook their heads and passed it on, 
while others wrote detailed, long reflections, even adding color illustrations. Some proudly signed their full names and addresses, other were carefully anonymous. Many first-timers thanked me for the opportunity to express their reactions and feelings in this very new environment. More poignant still, was some women who had shared terrific stories around the campfire but firmly refused to write anything down, explaining that early poverty, limited access to education, and insensitive teachers had left, th left them with writing phobia and shame. They did not want others to see their wrong spelling and grammar. For these women, I turned on my tape recorder and collected some of the best oral history, history in the land. I took that leather journal to different festivals for six years until every page had been filled. Then I bought another and another. In the end, I took blank journals to every festival I attended for a total of 33 years. Certainly not just Michigan. Camp Fest in Pennsylvania, Sister Fire in D.C., the National Women's Music Festival in Indiana, Rhythm Fest in Georgia, Numer in New England, the New England's Music... The New England Women's Music Retreat and Camp Sister Spirit in the trenches of rural Mississippi, where the brave producers Wanda and Brendan Hansen woke up. Oh my god, woke up to find their dog shot and their mailbox stuffed with tampons. It took guts to attend women's music events in many states and cities then, but the boldest women in the country were undaunted and showed up. The festivals hosted authors, activists, filmmakers guest speakers of all backgrounds. One time, after circling through a huge audience at Michigan's day stage, my festy journal came back to me with an entire passage written by Alice Walker. She was seated just behind me. In creating longitudinal festival journals before women had computers, blogs, Twitter, or Facebook, I ended up with an archive of how self-worth developed in a marginalized com community. At the start of the 1980s, gay and lesbian Americans were still citizens without rights, felons vulnerable to the random application of state sodomy laws. These laws were upheld by the Supreme Court's Bowers v. Hardwick decision in 1986, the same summer I began group journaling at fests. Many lesbian mothers had already lost their kids to ugly custody battles. Others lost their jobs or their housing. My own girlfriend in 1986 was a single mother, unceremoniously evicted from her apartment along with her five-year-old son in the middle of an upstate New York winter when their landlady complained about the kinds of friends they attracted. I knew more women than I could count who were survivors of rape, street harassment, workplace harassment. Yet at festivals, as women wrote to me over and over, they felt safe. They could walk freely at night unafraid. They understood that their lives, beliefs, and primary relationships had values, had value. During that one week or two each summer, that annual semicolon of dignity, they recharged with fresh onslaught, with a fresh onslaught of challenges to come in the new year. Festivals also offered them glimpses of how society could be. As one woman wrote, quote, Each year I am reminded of what I need to know to live a woman-centered life and I take that knowledge back home and attempt to maintain this centeredness for 51 weeks until I can return to be nourished again, end quote. When the women's music contributed, sorry, what the women's music contributed to two generations of women was much, much more than guitar chords, as these excerpts written at a variety of festivals over the span of 30 years reveal. What does festival culture mean to you? Sun and heat, rain, cold, and everything in between. Lips and tits and globes of flesh. Transformation on the cellular level. I came to Michigan and my protective shell fell, falls away. My heart opens. I cry as I listen to the love songs and the pain of the women who have struggled to be who they are in the world that is as judgmental that is judgmental and harsh. At Michigan, I fall in love with my sweetie, myself, and the land. I see beauty in each woman and can breathe again.
This is my fifth time at Michigan, my first as a family. My partner and I adopted sisters aged four and nine. To see them bloom this past week, confident, confidence and willingness to try new things, it's been so incredible. For me alone, a sense of self-acceptance and calmness. I feel nowhere else. It is the best. Here with my partner at last, we can make love in the forest without fear. It's so nice to take that first breath on the land and know that I am free. This is the most spiritual place I have ever been. My shul, synagogue, is familiar, but not always comfortable. I have always felt most at home in the woods. Here, there are woods, women, and a place providing cultural familiarity and feminist spirituality. I am in love. To have our individuality supported and mirrored back to us is just beautiful. Here, my body is beautiful, my self-definition is sustained, and I am reminded how important it is to fight for a real world so liberating, so supportive and safe, peace and power. Since my childhood, I have never felt so safe and pure. I feel revived, rebirthed. My experience has been overwhelmingly in overwhelming, inexplicable. I have found myself speechless, moved to tears, greatly touched throughout my stay. I don't ever want to go home, because this is home. I have had a smile plastered on my face from the first for the first time in a long time. This is a place to see that estrogen is this real, forceful, challenging, particular thing that demands world view and culture. I was 25 when I first came here and experienced a solid week of real physical safety in the middle of a whole world. I love to see the babies and kids taking it for granted. Gretchen, performer Gretchen Phillips, coached us all on dehydration during the heat wave. It was delightful to hear three teenagers the next day quizzing each other on the path. Have you been drinking enough water and when did you last pee? Women's music festivals are about loud sex in nearby tents and community conflict. <laughs> when was the last time I did something for the first time? At this festival, I showered with friends in an open, in the open while entertained by live music, crowd surfed, made love in the forest, learned about American culture, and worked topless. The highlight of this festival was the offering of tobacco from produce, producer Lisa Vogel to the young Ojibwa woman. Now we can continue creating a vision on this sacred land. After the candles were blown out last white, two fuzzy orbs of light appeared on the stage as our ancestors appeared, cleansed the land and shed tears of joy that the sacred hoop is being rewoven. Luscious, earthy, wild, on the edge, pushing me beyond the edges of my fear, mother red and white oak, sister poplar swaying, sandy, dank, ferny ground. You bring me back every year from Minnesota. I am a festy virgin. Walking in the woods at 2 a.m. and not worrying about being harassed. What a feeling. I am from Oakland. One day, while working in childcare, a little girl said to me, I'm half fairy and half witch. My moms are both witches. I asked her if she had planned to study her heritage in the future, and she said, I don't need to study. I already know everything I need to know. The drumming has moved me every day. I watched sisters help a tall woman who fell. I watched young, middle, and elder-age women being free and strong. 
I came here to see my daughter, who has been gone a long time. It is the perfect place to get away from distracting, destructive society and just hold her and love her. And thank you for giving me the chance to put my emotions down in writing. Here, there are women with mastectomies, proudly showing their scars. I never really knew a home before here. How I wish I could bottle this energy, love, and spirit and give it away to those who needed it out here. Having charged my own batteries for another year, I must do the best I can to help my outside community. I have the music, the pottery, the books, the clothes, and the memories to guide and inspire me. The canopy of green covers our campsite of 17 years. The pulse of drumming interweaves with the voices of a woman's song circle. The laughter of newly known neighbors, all underscored by the chug of a tractor pulling women and children across the land. A palette of sounds creating a sense of home. So, I am not a camper. The first time I came to Michigan, I rented an RV, but just the first time. And now that's 16 years ago. See, I was walking through the woods late at night all those years ago when I realized I felt safe for the first time in my life. On my walk this morning, I overheard a mother explaining to her five-year-old child why we have different skin colors. She pointed to a leaf, asked her daughter to touch it, to touch a different one said that they live side by side in beautiful harmony, and we should too. She then touched her heart with her hand, looked at the little girl and said, it's what's inside that counts. Here's a moment I'll capture for you. 4.45 p.m. on Saturday, acoustic stage, watching dragonflies dart through the air. I'm looking for a spot that's going to be shady for the next two hours. Which way does the sun move? So many beautiful women. Who to lean against? Where is everyone from? I asked those nearest me. Texas, Maine, LA, Winnipeg, New Zealand, Germany, Australia. Gee, no one from Antarctica? In the middle of the night, it rained hard from 4.30 a.m. to 5.30 a.m. I mean lightning, thunder, and torrential rain. I lay in my secure, warm tent, cuddled up with my remarkable, sweet partner of 17 years, thinking that if my life ended in that moment, I had all I needed. The best show was not on stage this year. It was the women in wheelchairs having scooter races, and I was honored to be a member of the pit crew. When you bring your child here, every year is a snapshot of her life. This was the year I watched my little girl bloom into a lovely young lady. Thank you for asking me to frame that moment. I usually sleep with earplugs in. I'm very guarded in the outside world, about my sonic space, among other things. Last night, I crawled into my tent, listening to salsa music from the dance. Women singing at campfires, all so sweet. 
I felt safely held and I felt asleep and I fell asleep happy. Later, I was awakened by scolding raccoons and I found I missed the sound of women celebrating. Stars decorated the sky as I walked to the shower. Then I saw her. She smiled at me and said hello. Topless with one breast. This exception needs to be seen every day. Topless without a breast. Where are the one-breasted fashion in our world? The celebration of I'm still here. I'm sitting in the sun listening to Holly Near with my shirt off. And a woman comes up to me and quietly asks permission to paint the dancing goddess on my chest. I felt privileged. My 11-year-old goddaughter, who had been to this festival every year of her life, held up one of the signs in the opening ceremony. Hers said, acceptance. It was her first performance, and she strode in so firm and tall and purposeful, a word moving among us. I watched my daughter and her girlfriend cuddling together on a blanket at the night stage. The sun was still bright overhead, and I felt such bliss looking at them, to know that my daughter has all of this, a place for her. So glad. My 16-year-old foster daughter has only been with us for one month. She threw her hands up at the sky and shouted about how at home she felt. Watching her, wearing brightly colored wings, flitting about, was my favorite moment. I'm laying at the very back of the night stage field, in sweatpants, eating chips, looking up, listening to music, cuddling my partner, and joking and laughing loudly about our relationship. We can do all of these things, not fearing that we'll be accosted or humiliated. Throughout the week, I'm gaining more confidence in the possibility of growth and change, both for me and for everyone in this community. I grew up in Detroit during the civil rights movement with the riots in our backyard. Finding sacred women's land in the rural northwestern Michigan is a true homecoming. After listening to the incredible, powerful drumming, something shifted dramatically for me. It moved me so. I cried tears of freedom. If you come back here every year, the magic grows and matures the way relationship, a relationship does. Fiery and passionate the first year, comfortable, spiritual, and full of surprises thereafter. This home, this heaven on earth. During the final song, I came unglued, leaving my skin itself. It stained, sorry. During the final song, I came unglued. Leaving, my skin itself is stained with the air's own stickiness, and I realize something liberating and inspiring. It is not the leaving itself that swirls in my stomach and brings tears to my eyes, but the warm calypso of festival farewells from the random, periodically encountered pals. The women who year after year rub suntan lotion on your back, help to raise your tarp, let you cut in the dinner line when you're exhausted from a work shift. These are the goodbyes that remind me. This is how family grows. These writings formed a river of life I drank from again and again as I considered how best to understand and archive this cultural location, which we all knew would be taken away from us at any moment by the local vandals, homophobic sheriffs, or unflattering investigative journalists. What is precious and sustaining to one's self-defined family is not always valued by others. This reality hit me hard in the summer of 1991 when I was robbed. A festigoer filled that very last page in my long enduring first journal as I packed up and left for the Michigan Festival that August and I flew home. No more chartered buses. No more chartered buses. Eager to read through the read through the final pages. Someone followed me from the T subway in Boston that night, grabbing my knapsack in a split second when I set it down on the front porch and turned to open my screen door. In that one second, I lost six years of passing a journal through crowds of 7,000 women. While I had often worried about the possibility of a fire 
or flood damaging my own journals. It had never occurred to me that my festival might be lost, might, might be stolen by someone who could not possibly understand. What if the thief used the personal information in those entries maliciously to threaten or extort? How many women might be hurt? As lesbians, we were all at risk. No laws protected us. How could I explain the contents of my journal to the police? I didn't. I said nothing. For days, I lay in bed, suffocating with loss. The loss of six summers of work collecting women's words. The portrait of a movement that might never be preserved in other terms. Never mind that the thief also took my wallet, camera, my journal, my Harvard ID, my credit cards, my paycheck, and other treasured commodities, such as my hard-won lifeguard license. Once again, a probably random act had led to the obliteration of women's history. How often had that happened in ways large and small, deliberate or casual, crimes of commission or omission? I thought of all those women's poignant comments about how safe they felt at festivals from crime. Two days later, the phone rang. It was a woman's voice. Hello, I don't know you. Maybe you lost your knapsack? She began hesitantly. But somebody threw a bag under my porch, and there's a notebook with your phone number on it. He kept everything replaced, replaceable, this thief, and he left both my journal and the festival journal somewhere safe and dry close by. I ended up thanking him over and over in my head. I got six years of women's writings back. After this experience, I was a woman on fire, usually taking two or even three journals to every festival and participating in five or six festivals annually as they began to stretch from Easter to past Labor Day. I gave up being a festi-goer and became a worker in order to have access to the interesting world backstage and to collect women's words from a wider range of festival roles. I worked as an MC, a workshop coordinator, a guest lecturer, an archivist, a backup singer. I led Passover seders, cleaned recycling barrels, hammered, greeted, ascended ladders, made furniture out of hay. For more than 10 years, I facilitated a discussion for Jewish women, many of whom had particularly challenging experiences by coming out as Jewish lesbians or feminists in the Jewish community they called home. See chapter four. In the Jewish tent at Michigan, I kept yet another blank journal for women to describe their journeys back to or away from Judaism. These public journals revealed that some women were on the path to rabbinical school or were contemplating preparing for a bat mitzvah at age 17, 70, or were adopting children and wondered how to instruct them religiously. At least one woman used the blank journal as a space for her own personal ad, checking every few hours to see if there were any romantic responses. Between my official work crew assignments and collecting as much women's writing as possible in two journals, I covered miles daily. To save my tired feet from running back to my remote tent site every time I ran out of ink, I hid extra fountain pen cartridges in favorite tree knot holes. Archiving lesbian culture was exciting work I was totally engaged in, but ironically, it limited my romantic life while at festivals. I could get much more done 
and collect much more women's writings if I didn't have a date during concerts. <laughs> For most years, this was not a problem. During my 40s, I had a partner who camped with me at Michigan just once, and after that, stayed at home. And in my 30s, I had various girlfriends on other work crews whose schedules were more demanding than mine. We simply met up in the wee hours in our tent. I was never the only woman who appeared to be spending her concert night, date night, with pen and paper. I could look across a vast landscape of women, lounging on blankets, tarps, and sleeping bags, woven mats, beach towels, polka dot sheets, and sand chairs, and spot dozens preoccupied in writing in their journals, absorbed, shirtless, unselfconscious. Public writing was everywhere. There were even love note bulletin boards in strategic places at Michigan where women left one another letters and poems, some writing on round paper plates. Work crew coordinators who often had to leave messages or instructions for others usually wore their notebooks, often just stapled together sheets of recycled paper around their necks. Flyers, notes, and hand-drawn ads for women crafts, crafts adorned every inch of the ubiquitous porta Janes, which collectively functioned as the town crier for events and issues. Although I did long to salvage and record those public writings too, one year my job assignment included depostering the rented toilet stalls. I let my Waterloo, I met my Waterloo in the achieving of wilted bathroom wall literature. Journaling workshops were embedded in festival culture. Kay Lee Hannigan was one popular presenter. Several comedians gained fame on the festival circuit, joked about this penchant for diaries in our community. Leah Delaria, who later performed on Broadway and in television's Orders the New Black series, expressed her bewilderment that some women went to the festival dances, met other women they were attracted to, and danced with them. Quote, and then, and then she just goes back to her tent and writes about it in her journal, end quote. Lugging my own diary through the woods, losing fountain pens down gopher holes at various festivals, I still found time to describe my own experiences. Partying with rock stars, leaping off the stage, mud wrestling after a sudden storm, being the self-appointed note taker at our own work crew wrap-up meeting, and then the long drive home and re-entry with wet laundry afterward. Thousands of other women's diaries, too, contain vivid descriptions of the festival era, a genre still untapped. These representative excerpts are mine from the Michigan Festival in 1995, when I was 34. August 1995. Last night, I dove into the night staged mosh pit from the end of the runway. I was sitting by the mosh pit area talking with Kay Hagen, and we agreed that nothing in Western or American education prepares girls for, uh, to ask for writing time in their adult lives as women. Just then, the mosh pit opened after to Toshi Reagan's great, great set, and I ran to get in position. I wore well-padded clothes, purple sweatpants, plaid flannel, my sneakers, no jewelry. Then I saw Tony dive in. I saw her caught, lifted, and carried around on a sea of hands. I jumped up on the runway and dove. It wasn't like diving so much more like falling in, onto an open, an ocean of upheld palms, not poking fingers or grabbing fists. I quickly turned over onto my back and saw the night sky, the stars, the sound tower, white and black hands against smoky night. I shouted, I'm flying, I'm flying, as I was passed around in a total trust, lying on my back, my arms spread Christ-like. I climbed up again and went in, wearing only my brother's surfer pants. I finally reeled away, shaken, overwhelmed. As I left the field, I saw Tony hide her camera, hand her camera to someone, climb onto the runway, taking a running leap and dive and disappear.
Now, 8.55 p.m. the next day. For the record, I am in fr the front row, and a woman has just parachuted out of the sky into the night stage audience. This is the uh, it moment which follows the other it moments of human experience. Till day alone, I have officiated as a rabbi at Shabbat services and an actual bat mitzvah in the woods, danced in the raid, rain, laid under a tree, and let ants crawl all over me. Just now, the whole audience is smiling, relaxing, smiling. Everyone, that is, but the rain crew, standing tense and ready to one side. There is only yesterday to describe all the emotional and actual weather which coats this whole experience like honey or glass or warm almond milk glaze. It was hot when I went to sleep and hot when I woke up. Everyone spritzing themselves with water or soaking their head under a faucet or guzzling water, ice cream, and watermelon. Scout walked around shouting, get your ice cream raffle tickets here. Oh, no, ice cold raffle tickets here. <laughs> there are sweaty skins, backs, necks, faces glistening everywhere. Showers fail to quell the sense of fungus growing on one's clothes. Then the cloud burst and, and flooded tents. Now this, the last day, was every woman pulling the majority of her tent's contents out onto the bushes and trees, limbs to dry, while the land crew walked through, wringing their hands, beseechingly, no, please don't drape things on tree branches. Women are hugging goodbye and exchanging addresses, and now the transition to the outside world, mouse. Tony has 60 inches of mail waiting for her in Chicago. I don't know if my car will start, or where I left my keys. There is a spectrum of objects and anxieties between here and there. We leave the leaf and fern, the Milky Way and the mosh pit, the tent and the hay bale for keys, cars, fast food shops, television, newspapers, refrigerators, flush toilets, air conditioning, bathtubs, classrooms, banks. I have over 400 miles to drive tomorrow, which I will do while thinking and crying and remembering. Last night, storm clouds moved in quickly. We all rushed to zip up our tents, but I stayed out in the storm to watch women mud wrestle. Producer Lisa Vogel was dragged into the slot by several performers. A fantastic jam impromptu began when Vicky Randall, Linda Tillery, and Annette Aguiara, Aguiera, everyone from the work crews was dancing nude, covered in mud, wine bottles and beer passed around, one interpreter and her lover getting in, on the right in the open field, several couples, couples on the runway, four women in the sound tower, voguing. In the middle of the orgy, though, I went to the garbage to rescue old set lists and other archival material that had been thrown away. Final community meeting, 10 a.m., all crews reporting. Inventory, says the festival used 37,200 feet of twine this year. The belly bowl where festival workers ate their meals, served 10,000 cups of coffee, 24,000 cold drinks, washed 20,000 pieces of silverware, 4,000 bagels, 1,000 box, 1, boxes of cereal, 800 loaves of bread, 15,000 pounds of fruit, 20 gallons of milk, 1,250 1, pounds of rice, 250 chairs had been cleaned up after the mud fights. Massage tent, gave 80 massages each day. Night stage. There were 150 performers this year. Porta Jane. There were 242 toilets rented out for the land. 100 were set up on one day. Of nine women who la uh, of nine women on last year's work crew, seven returned. This was the first time we had a crew returnees. I was shocked, and we only had one code brown. Yeah, they went into the Jane to suck it out but their equipment was set on blow.
store, every ice cream truck broke down at least twice. Interpreting services. There are over 70 deaf women this year. Sprouts. Cared for 75 toddlers. They need a mom support area. Photography. Tony shot 2,163 frames this year. She talks about the importance of our cultural artifacts. Lisa Vogel, producer. There were 7,551 festi goers. The best festival I ever had, and I appreciate deeply the level of cooperation. It feels like a rebirth, a decision of how we all want to be together, and I love everybody. Community discussion. Smoking. In designated areas only, one worker says, I'm not interested in returning to third-class citizenship. Racism. The incidents that happened on the land get piled up until they are simply listed at the end of the fest without time to deal with them. How do we have san sanctions for racist acts on the land while still giving uneducated white women room to grow and learn? One worker says, safe space here is a myth. While we interrogate tobacco smoking as harmful and intrusive, we forget about racism. Male music played on the land. Several workers' dances used men's tapes this year. One worker expresses concerns that whole genres are being shut out. Example, hip-hop, which relies on sampling. Now home, 16th of August, drove 400 plus miles in eight hours flat on $18. Yes, $18 worth of gas. Arrived in 100 degree heat. Everything seems old and new, as though I had never before handled a computer, an elevator door, or a bottle of whiteout. <clears throat> Returning from Michigan is indeed a journey, akin to leaving a beloved planet and grudgingly plunging back into a more polluted atmosphere. Very far from work, the matriarchal jungle and its tents. Re-entry takes work, aside from the anxiety welling up a hundredfold. First, the goodbye, the goodbyes, hugs, kisses, guilt for not staying on the land longer to wrestle with red rugs and wrapped planks. Dread at the long drive in a possibly sick car. Then 400 miles through downpour, steaming Indiana heat and utterly masculine freeways. At one point, near Carmel, Indiana, I had a wet fertilizer truck in front of me and a guy with a Fear the Lord sticker on my right, and on my left, a trunk with a well-filled gun rack and a sticker announcing, You're next. Back in my apartment, the fetid air made me sneeze, so I used all my remaining toilet paper blowing my nose, and I had to go out to the store and first get some money en route. 
But my bicycle tires had deflated during the heat wave, so I walked carrying all the heavy bags of groceries. Of course, no food at home either.
The familiar ritual of unpacking and cleaning after a festival. First, I took both a bath and a shower. Then, yet another shower, to hand wash my knapsack, my rain poncho, and my new non-color fast tie-dye underwear, my nylon toiletry case. Two loads of laundry downstairs, with unspeakable things floating up out of the lint filter. <laughs> Leaves, insect bodies, spider legs, and the effluvia of nature. Both of my mosh pit shirts will have to be bleached. I used a nail brush on my necklace chain, which had actually rusted, and then rubbed Lexol over my black leather jacket, which was still growing live mold. My leaking fountain pens, sandy suitcase, muddy shoes, and sticky shot glasses were all cared for in short order. Then onto the drugstore to drop off all four rolls of film, onto the post office to pay bills, and then all of this to get quarters for the churning laundry at home. Take out the garbage, clean under the sink where a giant spider had spun her web in my absence, blow my nose some more, hang the hand laundry out to dry, search the entire parking lot for the coolant cap that fell off my car. My right eye is swollen, when did that happen? Untangle and put away all the jewelry. File the mail pile. Uh, an hour on the phone making inquiries about flights to Mimi Bakweska's recording session in Missouri. Now I sit down amid my Michigan loot, set lists to archive, a new festy journal filled with women's comments, and I pour myself an iced coffee and burn incense to put on and put on the women's music CDs I just acquired. I have all evening to write if I wish, yet for an instant I turn on the television and the news is revolting. France testing nuclear bombs, more women raped in Bosnia, police caught in racist mischief at their annual roundup. I laugh once again at those who accuse feminist culture of narrowness. How about width of integrity? Except for some unavoidable heat exhaustion, 8,250 women of all races, festigoers plus workers plus performers, just lived in harmony for a week without weapons. I have befriended every producer in the country. I eat with the most influential women in the scene. I sit at the right hand of the best photojournalist in women's music and dance with her shirtless on the runway under shooting stars. I have everything I want, and I'm still young enough to make my mark. What am I going to do with these notes? This writing by light spill in the audience. Living tribally once a year, we are together in a concentrated bank statement of time. Cultural richness and cultural capital being the bottom line of accumulated principle. Two weeks for 20 years running, equals almost a year of real time. 
I lived in, Mich in Michigan by now. A year of accumulated living in a separate reality. The year's emotional scrapbook is built on this foundation, this utopian community. Coming back from a summer festival work is like having a well-stocked ladder. Does anyone say larder anymore? To live off of for months. The food groups of memory are each vital and nutritious. Love, politics, spirituality, humor, matriarchal creativity, the great delicacies to dine from all winter long. I have only begun to stockpile, to inherit this knowledge. I am, in my 30s, a sponge. My actual methodology, embedding myself into participation and work roles, attending as many performances and crew meetings as possible, the practice of taking notes or writing in a spiral notebook across 35 years of festival culture, meant adapting to all the environments and conditions described here. The National Winds Music Festival met at air-conditioned college campuses in the Midwest, and Camp Fest housed women in bunk bed cabins of a rented private summer camp with picnic tables and cozy Adirondack chairs but the Michigan Fe Festival intentionally built no permanent structures on its hundreds of acres of forest other than, controversial even at the time, two paved pathways, pathway loops to accommodate women with wheelchairs and baby strollers. We were out in the elements, more or less night and day, in the best of weather years, and most years saw either a heat wave or a series of thunderstorms or both, the damp air saturated notebook paper, Many were my efforts to trick weather nature by carrying my journal in a plastic bag. All my festival journals are held together in some place with duct tape. Most contain ferns and a, sw and a swatted insect or two, useful to Jurassic Park style scientists looking to reconstitute lost species through mosquito blood. I wrote as fast as possible in the dark on an anthill by flashlight at campfires with mosquito swollen hands with knuckles and fingers bruised from hammering. In 1999, the book I titled Eden Built by Eves, I presented some of my research on the culture of women's music festivals, the first, though certainly flawed and limited, effort to address that such events meant to powerful lesbian performers, workers, and audiences who had by then been enthusiastic participants across a quarter century era. I reported that as late as the last year of the 21st, 20th century, Heading off to a festival weekend still served as a rite of passage for women seeking connection with others beyond their own local lesbian communities. For returning festigoers, annual residents in a temporary lesbian majority village enabled them to re-enter homophobic society armed with a greater self-worth and resilience. The interviews I collected at numberless different, different regional events were consistent. Women asserted gratefully that they had never felt safer than on women's land, and that going to festival recharged their batteries for another year. With this solid base of loyal, annually returning participants, some festivals had started selling lifetime tickets at fundraisers, as fundraisers, committing both buyer and seller to an investment in the future of women's music. Through the early 1980s, Michigan, the Michigan Festival also offered free admission to women over 60, elders at that time who were treated deferentially both as precious resources and as a group without the retirement income men were more likely to receive. At 20, I cheerfully looked forward to enjoying the free admission benefits 40 years from down the line, believing with complete confidence that Mishfest would still be there in 2021 and that I, then entering my 60s, would still be showing up loyal to the event and prepared to camp out naked. Barely 15 years since I published Eden, most festivals have disappeared forever. In its final year, Michigan was the subject of a boycott by the Human Rights Campaign, Equality Michigan, GLAAD, and the National Center for Lesbian Rights, which later recanted after a massive drive by lesbians to cancel, cancel contrib contribution checks and membership cards.
The reason why women headed off to the last ever Mich Michigan festival were remarkably similar to what motiv motivated festi goers in 1976. The music, safety, women-only space. For lesbians not attending, the reasons had changed dramatically, aging and health issues, a broader range of vacation choices thanks to LGBT rights victories, and also concerned about the inclusion of trans women. As attacks on the festival from conservative groups had largely abated, attacks by LGBT allies took center stage, and the new tools of social media marshaled to rebuke veteran participants in festival culture. How did we get here? The answer is a complex blend of LGBT rights and evolving technology. In the, the 1990s melted into a new century marked by dramatic changes in communication. Women began taking laptop computers to festivals. At Michigan, bewildering, bewildering new concerns came up in community meetings. Women who sought to keep the rural camping experience as natural as possible hated the sounds of keyboard typing and electronic media beeps now echoing, echoing through the forest's early hours. Others confronted the problems of campers who demanded to plug in and recharge personal computers during a festival week when there were barely enough outlets maintained by one hero heroic electrician for coffee pots and light bulbs. The already overburdened grid had to serve as a reliable lifeline for women with disabilities, whose priorities in a camping situation included recharging their wheelchairs, refrigerating medications, and storing oxygen tanks. Privacy and propriety issues, too, emerged as the advent of mobile phones with built-in video recorders and texting capabilities made amateur archivists out of everyone. A challenge to the Michigan Festival in particular was how to regulate thousands of women now taking concert photos and then sending them out into the universe via social media in blithe disregard of privacy guidelines that had been developed over decades. On-stage performances could be downloaded and shared so easily, including footage of topless women or nude children dancing in the audience. Festivals had always been protective of attendees' privacy and artists' control of their music as a commodity. A laptop might have been have allowed me to take and store notes much faster, especially at community meetings where I collected statistics. Though my overt journal writing at those meetings already concerned some folks, these cautious debates over the sharing of intentional or of information were one more step in the longitudinal defense against harassment. Although younger festival workers argued that social media and an active online presence would attract more women to attend Michigan. This was beginning to see a downsizing in its audience. Caution towards the power of the internet proved prescient. Beginning in 1994, the Michigan Festival entered a new era of backlash that would escalate from dissent to disruption to disinformation campaigns online. And unlike earlier festival issues, this controversy revealed a rift, a generational gap between the slowness of old school processing and the immediacy of online activism.